Thanks. Uh, thank you for the invite. Thank you for all giving up your time this evening and, and being here. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk in very broad terms about one of my favourite generals, Bernard Montgomery. Um, I'm sure that many of you here have got perhaps some quite strong views about Montgomery. Um, he seems to be something of a Marmite leader. Um, many people think he is the best general um, that Britain has had since Wellington. Um, others um, wouldn't give him the time of day and say that he was actually divisive, arrogant, um, certainly a man that didn't take criticism well. I've got sympathy, actually, with both of those points of view. But what became apparent to me is that we as a military community and myself as an academic seem to know a great deal about Montgomery, certainly from El Alamein onwards. The glory years, 42, 43, 44 and into 1945. But what we don't know much about is how he developed to be the leader that he became. So what were the stepping stones for Montgomery towards becoming a general in the Second World War? What were the influences? And so what I thought I'd do tonight is um, give you a brief background as to some of those early influences, um, those that he had prior um, to the interwar years, prior to 1920, and then take you through some of the key stepping stones that I think were influential, not just in the interwar years, but actually throughout his career. Um, if you're looking for evidence that Montgomery was an arrogant shit, you will find it in abundance. And that's what a great deal of um, academic study has seemed to try to, to do. It's tried to pigeonhole Montgomery as something of a bad leader, but a great general. And I started to delve into the interwar years because, as the Colonel says, I've been writing a book about Patton, Montgomery, Montgomery and, and Rommel and their leadership journeys, trying to understand how different cultures, different backgrounds influence leadership journeys and then bringing them together on the Second World War battlefield. And I came up with quite a lot of evidence that Montgomery, in fact, was, if not a good leader or a great leader, a very effective one during the interwar years. And it begins to make a little bit more sense to me as to why he was quite so rapidly promoted at a time when the British Army was shrinking, even though the threat was growing. Um, so to start with, some of the early influences on his, um, his being, his approach to life and his approach to leadership. Um, I think that we need to say that he came from a highly successful family. Montgomery was born into a, a family that could trace its ancestry back to Roger de Montgomery, who came across with William the Conqueror, was a kinsman of William the Conqueror. His antecedents had been in vast tracts of land in Shropshire. And eventually that family found itself holding vast tracts of land in Northern Ireland, in Ulster, where the Montgomerys had, until the 1950s, their family seat, New Park House in Moville, in County Donegal. And this ancestry, this upper middle class family, expected its people, particularly its males, to succeed. And that was bred into the young Bernard. He was one of nine children the fourth child, the fourth boy, um, six eventually survived. Large families back in 1887 when Montgomery was born were not unusual um, for many reasons, not least the infant mortality rate was very high. But also there was a great feeling at the time that families such as the Montgomerys should try to, if you like, provide Britain with the sort of people that would run the empire be captains of industry, do well in whatever they did, be it the clergy, the military, the medical professional, whatever. And 
Bernard's father, and I think you could probably see the similarity between Bernard and his father, um, Henry. Um, Henry was a bishop. He had risen to the top of his profession, actually not because he was very bright, I would say, but from all um, of the sources that I've seen, because he was a bit of a plodder, actually just did it very well in each job and plodded along and eventually got to where he wanted to be. Leaving to one side those incredibly talented people that thought that they should be bishops, but actually fell to the way, wayside because they trod on other people's feet or had some odd, perhaps, religious views at a time when there was um, quite a lot of um, fervour of religious discussion in, in Britain about um, certain parts of the gospel. Another key figure in his life was his mother, Maud. Um, Maud was a ferocious character. And if Bernard looked like his father, he had his mother's personality. She was a very strict disciplinarian. And we'll come back to that influence on Montgomery as we go through this evening. Um, punctuality, politeness, precision, any number of P's, were what Maud expected her children to live by. Any stepping out of line would be punished, not just verbally, but often beatings. Beatings that actually on one occasion left Bernard Montgomery hospitalised. They had very little money as a family. Bishop Henry had uh, a small bishop stipend, but with a large family and with this house to keep, and he eventually um, inherits that house a year after Bernard is born, they found it very difficult to make ends meet. And so austerity became another very important part of Bernard's life. But while they were living in London, uh, Bishop Henry had a house in Kennington, which he rented. Long summers were spent in Northern Ireland, where Bernard did, I suppose, the upper middle class thing. He did a bit of socialising. He learned to ride. He was a very good shot. He learned to fish. And he basically learned self-reliance. But when he stepped through the door, Maud was waiting on the other side of it. And as I say, if he didn't finish his tea, if he didn't say his prayers, if he didn't use the right language, he would be beaten at worst or locked in the cellar where Bernard found himself spending many long, cold, damp evenings. So what was Bernard like growing up? I don't want to spend too much time on this. I do want to get to his leadership. But you can't take away from... Um, the story, the fact that Bernard was academically, I think we call it challenged nowadays. Um, his school reports from St Paul's in London talk about him age 13 as with potential, age 16 as backward, and as aged 18, just before he entered Sandhurst, as severely backward, in brackets, suited only for the infantry. <laughs> Make it that way you want. Um, the, th the fact of the matter is that Bernard managed to pass the Sandhurst entrance exam. And that was no mean feat, certainly for somebody that was backward. But what I'm saying is, is that he must have applied himself during his last year at school. When his headmaster is saying, no, this child is backward, he's never going to achieve, Bernard must have thought, my God, I'm either going to get beaten, I'm going to let the family down, or what, what am I going to do with myself? There's no family money. So he worked really hard to get into Sandhurst. And actually, in the entrance exam, he came in the top third. There was no doubt that when he applied himself, he could achieve things. That perhaps was an early lesson, aged 18. Or a reflection on army officers. Sorry? Or a reflection on army officers. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, no, you, you, you're perhaps right. And, but I think he fell into that mould. At St Paul's, you, you, you make a comment, but he was put in the army class. And I think he was put in the army class because he was the least intelligent. Um, there were five classes. The army class was for those that were struggling the most, that they could see no other career other than the army. 
And I think that when he was pushed at Sandhurst with people that perhaps were brighter than him, he eventually thought, my goodness, I am going to have to work. If I'm going to make this a career, I've got no other money. I'm actually going to have to make sure that I rise above the rest. So this Victorian work ethic, this latent, I won't call it intellectualism, he's, he never was an intellectual, but he was a bright guy. It just needed to be brought out of him in some way. I think Sandhurst did that. I, it's a whole different talk about what Sandhurst was teaching at the time, but it didn't really see itself as a leadership academy. It see, saw itself very much as a place where you would learn military skills, and if you were bright enough and you had good DS, and I think Bernard did, they would try to develop the leadership lessons from the task that you could then take on in your own time and move forward with. There were no leadership exams. There were no command tasks. There were no reports on leadership. It's can you draw? Can you march? Can you shoot? Do you know your military geography? Do you know your tactics? OK, pass an exam and on you, on you go. Just after Montgomery um, passed out of Sandhurst in 1908, actually there was a big um, inquiry into Sandhurst's um, syllabus and it changed dramatically, much more in line with Sandhurst that we know and love today, much more leadership focused, probably just too late for the First World War, um, but it was going to have severe and important influences on preparing those officers that are going to fight in the Second World War. Those that I suppose were just about Montgomery's contemporaries, probably his divisional commanders when he got to the very top. <coughs> um, I'm going to sort of dash over so we do cut to the chase um, and push on to the First World War. Just to say that at Sandhurst, he was selected by the Royal Warwickshire Regiment. Uh, the regiment selected you at the time. Um, uh, based upon various interviews and um, examination results. Um, he really had no say. But he wanted to go to um, a, a regiment that had a battalion in India because India allowed him to live on his officer's salary and there was an extra allowance. And it really does, if you read his diaries, you know, he had no, literally no money at all. He had no money for drink. He couldn't pay his mess bills. So when he got out to India, what does he do? He reads. He writes. He travels. He learns four languages. He watches. He observes. He interviews. And he got the reputation of, of as being a real oddity. And I think he was a bit of an odd character. I don't think he was very socially adept. He never was. But a lot of this was driven, I do think, by his background, his desire to fit in, his desire to succeed, not quite knowing how to do that. But an awful lot of it at this time, why is Montgomery up in his room? He had no money. No allowance, nothing, nothing else. So by the time we get to the First World War, he is an incredibly well-read young man. He's written a few articles. As I say, he spoke, he, he spoke and wrote at least four languages. Um, and he was beginning to get to grips with uh, an understanding, as he called it, of the military art. Um, one of the battalion officers that come back to India to his regiment had just come from staff college and became a mentor. Um, and that was coincidental um, that these, these two people um, sort of married up. But Montgomery was really looking somewhat looking for someone to, to, to look up to. And this officer, a man named Captain Fleming, was that man. Very quickly, a few sentences on him in the First World War. His First World War nearly ended before it started. Famously, I suppose, um, he was uh, a platoon commander at First Ypres in October 1914, leading um, a platoon attack on a machine gun position and leading from the front, um, was shot three times through the lungs and once in the leg and left out on the battlefield basically to die. He managed through sheer tenacity and good fortune to make it back to friendly lines and machine gun position was, was eventually taken and he was awarded the DSO for gallantry and leadership on that day, which again marked him out quite early on in the war. But he spent 18 months convalescing, but then was put in a series of staff jobs and those staff jobs were pretty crunchy for a young man. 
and he got to meet some of the greatest figures of the First World War, politicians and generals, French, British, um, as well as eventually Americans as well. And he eventually ends up, age 27, as chief of staff to a division with very, very little experience. Now, that's not wholly unusual. I mean, th th there was, in fact, a brigadier general, VC, MC, and Bar DSO, not quite the right order, age 26, died at Cambrai. But Montgomery really made his mark. Yeah, what have you been doing with your careers? Um, <laughs> but Montgomery made his mark. He had caught the eye. But just to round off this, these early influences, there was no um, guarantee that he would proceed up the ranks in the British Army. In, indeed, there was no guarantee he would even be able to um, attain a regular commission in the British Army. And it was only really through his contacts that he managed to do that. So let's... Um, just move on. I, I would now want to look at the interwar years, as I say, not by blow by blow, appointment by appointment account. Um, that will come in the book. Um, but I'm going to look at it from the perspective of what I believe now, having researched Montgomery, were his four leadership pillars. You will not find this any, in any writings from Montgomery. It has come through study, looking at his speeches, his writing, his orders, having interviewed people, looking at various papers that are in various archives. Still more work to do, but I think there were four different um, pillars that he rests his leadership on. But first of all, a direct quote from Montgomery. From 1929, he wrote in a paper that was published in the Russi Journal. He was a lieutenant, acting lieutenant colonel at the time that leadership was the key to British success in the war that he expected Britain would be fighting against Germany within the next 15 years. And his definition, and we all have our own definitions, this is Montgomery's and it shows you something about him, the capacity and will to rally men and women, so it's quite interesting at that time to include women, but he did do that, to a common purpose and the character which inspires confidence. There are so many words in that one sentence. Rally men and women, common purpose, character, inspires and confidence that come up time and time and time again when one reads his writings, his lectures, and the briefing papers that he gave over his whole career. Very few of them have actually been looked at before. And the first pillar that comes out of all of this is professional knowledge. Montgomery was absolutely evangelical about, evangelical about the need for um, leaders to have professional knowledge. So I said a minute ago, he expected there to be a war against Germany when many others didn't. And he thought that the British army was woefully prepared for that war through his study of the German army and their allies and looking at the British army. He did not want Britain to go to war again as unprepared as the army that he had been a part of in 1914. And of course, we all know in 1914, the Germans nearly did succeed. And of course, in 1940, they did, and Montgomery was there. And so Montgomery's driving motivations during the interwar years, whether he was at staff college, company commander, battalion commander, in staff appointments, was to initiate a programme of change to professionalise the British army. Not his team, the British Army. There's some arrogance there. He wanted to professionalise those men and women. And he wanted to prepare them for the fight. And he would stop at nothing to do that. 
and he thought that the first building block of that was professional knowledge. Having a thorough knowledge of his job, of his profession, is an absolute prerequisite for a leader. And then a never-ending study to keep himself up to date. It's important to understand that what Montgomery had learned at Sandhurst, that he would have to work hard to succeed, and then put into practice in India, and probably did right the way through the First World War in the wee small hours. I know that he wrote a number of manuals on his own time that were published by divisions and corps, was to always ensure that he educated himself and to fill the gaps that in many cases have now been filled by professional courses in the British Army, but at the time there just weren't those sort of courses. He read a lot, he wrote a lot. By the time he was a company commander, he had 18 articles to his name. And many of them were at the forefront of military thinking. It's not because he was a great, as I say, intellectual, but he absorbed the ideas of others. He discussed great ideas with the great military thinkers of the day. A good mate was Basil Little Hart, that many of you undoubtedly will have heard of, one of the great thinkers of the age. J.F.C. Fuller, he was writing to generals actually not just British generals, and saying, what do you think? And reflecting their views and writing articles. And saying, British Army, what do you think? His great, um, I suppose, love in this field was training. He really felt that training, getting the best, best training techniques, understanding training areas, um, linking them to fighting methods um, were, were, were absolutely critical. And he got a reputation for being bright, but also for being someone who was a bit of a military bore, to be frank. In an army at the time when we had, I suppose, forgotten the need to prepare for the next war and were lying back a little bit, thing, still licking our wounds from the First World War. Montgomery was saying, no, there's no, there's no time to sit back. We've got to really drive forward. In 1920, when he was at Staff College, and he got into Staff College by the skin of his teeth, again, by a social connection, um, I recently saw a report from one member of the directing staff that called him a bloody menace. The commandant wrote an unofficial report to um, the general that he was then going to serve and called... Uh, Montgomery a little shit. And basically, everyone at Staff College felt that this was a man who was to be respected, but no one wanted to socialise with or serve with. He had marked himself out as different, and he was not going to play anybody's game. He was not going to fit in. He felt that he was right, and everybody else would have to fall to line themselves with his way of doing things. The second pillar, the second building block, is moral courage. Um, Monty believed in speaking his mind to anyone that would listen, and in fact many that didn't really want to listen. Whether it was in the mess, talking shop, which certainly at the time was really frowned upon, or it was in meetings, it was Montgomery that always talked. He always had a point of view. He didn't care whether he was talking to men of his own rank or to superior officers. A thought came into his head, he'd say it. If he felt, felt that somebody was saying something that was factually incorrect or there was another point of view, he would say it. He couldn't stop himself. And as you can see from this quote here from his memoirs, as the sparks flew upwards, I was often in trouble due to my habit of saying what I thought in no uncertain voice. He was sacked twice, once as a brigade major, once as a company commander, and came very close in 1929 to being thrown out of the army altogether when he actually um, found that he was being confronted by a panel of senior generals who um, felt that this was a man that was basically just not following orders 
and had no place in an army where discipline was absolutely crucial. But he managed to find his way through again through connections, people that felt that he had potential. Um, in 1932, to give you another example, um, he became the commanding officer of the f uh, 1st Royal Warwickshire Regiment in, um, posted in the Middle East. And they were conducting a divisional exercise. And Montgomery by that time had this reputation for being um, a great trainer of troops. Um, he'd done great things um, as a company commander and was doing great things um, as a battalion commander. And therefore, at the end of the first day, the GOC was giving a summary. And he turned to Montgomery on his right, and everybody in the room knew that he was a great trainer of troops, and therefore the GOC said, OK, Montgomery, so what do you think of that? So what did you think of my summary in the day's events? And Montgomery, and I'll make sure that I've got the quote right, he said, sir, that is absolute nonsense. It's tosh. You've just got it all wrong. Stun silence. New lieutenant colonel. Sharp intake of breath. And the general then says, OK, Montgomery, so what would you have done differently? He then gave a tour de force for an hour as to where the general and his two brigadiers got it wrong. He said, we're out of date with our tactics. We're using the wrong ground. We're leading in the wrong way. And I've seen this paper. It's, it's, it's absolutely remarkable because luckily there was somebody that was transcribing all of the notes. And this would be lost to history. But it's only when you recognize that this exercise was taking place in Egypt on exactly the ground that in 19... 42, 43, he then fought on, and the battle that he then um, exercised on the second day of the exercise was going to be on exactly the same ground as El Alamein. He knew his military history, he knew his doctrine, he knew his tactics, he knew the kit, he understood motivation and morale, he understood the enemy, he brought it all together and gave this remarkable, as I say, tour de force was again one of those occasions where he could have been sacked but the general bit his lip wrote him a bad report told him to stay in line but actually also showed some flexibility himself third building block of four building teams i think we'd all recognize the uh, truth of that quote well led well trained and intelligent teams are the key to success on the battlefield it is essential that leaders create those teams, and it starts with the correct personnel. Montgomery was a man in a hurry. And his arrogance, his confidence, whatever you want to call it, often led him to take decisions without advice, without consultation. And so, for, again, if we use the example of when he was a, a new CEO in the Middle East, he watched his team for a few weeks and then started to sack people because he could, because they didn't fit what he felt was important for the teams that he wanted to lead. And the two things he was looking for was professional competence and the ability to inspire people and create confidence within the team. If anybody didn't have those things, they were gone. Because he was a man in a hurry. And this is why it's really important to see leaders in the context of the time. Because I can say, sitting back, my God, that was heavy-handed. Of course he annoyed people. He lost the sergeant's mess because he sacked a whole swathe of NCOs. But, and there's a big but here, within six months, his battalion was deemed to be the best in the brigade. Within nine months, it's the best in the division. And within a year, his methods were being exported to the British Army as best practice. He had annoyed large numbers of people. Some people at this time never spoke to him again. But, my God, he created a strong team. And it was the basis for some remarkable success moving forward. He called it shuffling the pack. And often you'll see references to that in his work. Um, let's move on to the fourth pillar, trust. 
I think that if you're, if you're looking for trust with those people that he sacked, you're not going to find it. But he was incredibly loyal and created a bond with those people that he thought had professional competence and could lead and inspire. So if a leader has the complete confidence and trust of his men, there is nothing he cannot do, nothing. The leader is a man who can be looked up to, whose judgment is trusted, who can inspire and warm the hearts of those he leads. He was, in many regards, a man ahead of his time because he talks a lot about empowerment, that overused word, almost hackneyed now, empowerment, or not somebody else wittering on about empowerment. But everything that Montgomery did, you know, when he was sacking people, when he was developing professional knowledge, when he was saying the things that he said in a way that perhaps he shouldn't have said them, in a language that was inappropriate and at a time that was just wrong, he was driving forward to create a trust, an authenticity, to use another <laughs> word that we're all familiar with. And people could trust him. Because when he could trust them, he could then empower them. So yes, often he was very direct and authoritarian, transactional. But actually his aim was really transformation. Because once he'd got the team, he trusted them, he empowered them. And he just took his hands off. I'll give you a, another quote. In 1933, one of Montgomery's company commanders wrote to a friend, Monty behaves in a way that no other CEO has ever behaved. We are told what to achieve, but not how to achieve it. It's simply marvellous working under him. And if you look at the way that the British army was um, organised, what it was taught, how it was trained, it was much more um, centralised command. Empowerment was not really a thing. It's not even really a word. And almost Montgomery brings it into the lexicon of the British army. Because he said, that's, allow, to uh, use another phrase that he uses, allow professionals to be professional in what they're professional in, then I can do my job. And you do yours. I can't do both. That's pretty unusual at the time. So, in conclusion, before we move on to the one last sort of case study of 1940, Montgomery in action. By 1939, as the storm clouds are gathering over Europe, we've got this character that some of his men don't quite get. But certainly those that are Monty's men, a part of his team, absolutely adore. He had a reputation for being highly professional, the best trainer of troops in the British Army. He had very high standards, but he was also very, very difficult. So why on earth in August 1939 did he get promoted from commanding a brigade out in Palestine, which again, you know, he was only meant to be there for six months and most people thought, right, that will top him out and we'll, we'll, we'll you know, we'll see him, see him out of the army at that. Why, why all of a sudden did he become a major general? And I suppose the reason for this is that somebody saw potential in him. And his great, great patron at this time was a man named Alan Brooke. Now, Alan Brooke will be a name that resonates with some of you. Um, because he becomes one of the most, well, I think one of the, the greatest generals that Britain has ever produced, but perhaps, um, you know, a man that is lost a little bit to history because he spent most of the Second World War sitting behind the desk at the War Office, directing people, working with politicians, keeping um, Winston Churchill in check. But actually, in 1939, 1940, he was a corps commander, and he was the uh, second Corps commander, which was the strike corps of the British Expeditionary Force. And he knew of Montgomery, knew his, his reputation, knew him a little bit socially and says, I want that man as my third division commander, the strike division of the strike corps. Why? Because I've got no time to prepare these divisions and I want Montgomery to get that division where it needs to be. I need him to bind it. I don't care what these methods are like. We must prepare for the Germans or else we're going to get blown away. 
He needs to be given a chance. And so that's how he got his chance. In October 1939, freshly minted Major General Montgomery, who'd only been a full colonel two years before, was leading Britain's foremost division across the Channel and was looking to face the Germans. His last confidential report read, as you can see there, an officer of great military skill who delights in responsibility, tick. He's definitely above the average of his rank, tick. Should attain high rank in the army, okay. He can only fail to do so if a certain high-handedness which occasionally overtakes him becomes too pronounced. Question mark. There's a question mark over Montgomery. And in a different lecture, I'd say, well, let's look at those that might have been promoted, Major General in his place. I think he was the best of a pretty bad lot. I don't think there were a great deal of alternatives here. This guy stood out. He'd made himself stand out, and he got the gig. And he did extraordinarily well in France. This man here, rather unimposing figure, is Alan Brooke and obviously Montgomery standing next to him. Um, there were very few men that um, Montgomery looked up to, but he looked up to Alan Brooke. And the older I get, and the more I work with the British Army and other organisations, the more I understand that actually, as much as I, I don't like the idea that social connections and knowing people from 20 years ago can help people's careers and all of that sort of stuff, nepotism, it happens, it's a reality, and a lot of people get a, a lift up in their careers because of that, even today. Well, back then, it's even more important. And the great um, connection between these two is that they came from the same place intellectually. They were both sort of self-made men, worked very hard. But they'd worked together at Staff College. Montgomery became a member of the DS at um, Camberley in the late 1920s, and the commandant at the time was Alan Brooke. And I think it was at that stage that Montgomery won Alan Brooks' confidence and um, continued to nurture that relationship right the way through the Second World War. So, um, moving on. This um, divisional symbol here, we still have that symbol for third division, don't we? That's Montgomery's invention. Second day in the job, August 1939, said, right, what's the divisional logo, we need to start to get an identity for this division, creates a flag, drives around in a staff car with his flag prominently produced, starts to understand his units and starts to create confidence and inspire people and all those other good things. Again, that's for another lecture, um, but he starts the hard work of drawing this probably underperforming division together. In fact, the, the, the previous GOC was sacked for, for underperformance. He certainly was thought not to be able to, um, to cut it with the Germans when, when the invasion came. Um, I just want to very quickly um, look at those four pillars now in wartime and, and their influence. Montgomery building a team. He felt the best way to build a team a team of teams, and he uses that phrase, building a team of teams. It's not Stanley McChrystal coming up with that phrase. He uses the phrase, building a team of teams, in October, November 1939. He says, I don't know when the Germans are coming. They're probably going to come on the other side of Christmas. Therefore, what we've got to do is we've got to exercise, exercise, exercise. We've got to learn each other's strengths and weaknesses. We've got to learn to communicate with each other, and we've got to learn to trust each other. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. But what are the other nine divisions in the BEF doing at this time? They're not doing much. Between November 1939 and March 1940, Montgomery led four divisional exercises. Only one other division in the BEF undertook one divisional exercise. All of the other divisions undertook none at all. They're learning the skills required to fight the Germans on that ground. 
Montgomery was all over it. He knew his history of the cockpit of Europe. He knew. He'd been on battlefield tours. He'd been on 50 or 60 battlefield tours to this region, often cycling himself, not taking a car, too expensive, cycling with his subalterns through the countryside. He knew every nook and cranny. He knew all the movements and how the movements would be dictated by the ground. All of the exercise, exercises exercised real-life problems that he expected his division to come up against, often in withdrawal. He didn't expect to be um, attacking for long. He expected to be pushed back. He's a pretty practical man because he knew the strengths of the Germans. But, of course, this was also a test. Remember, test your people and then get rid of those that can't do and can't lead. And that's really important in the building of Montgomery's teams. Um, in February 1940, a Grenadier Guards captain wrote in his diary, Montgomery only came to us in September, but has created a new esprit de corps. And it's been built on the basis of a long overdue overdue professionalism. In April 1940, Alan Brooke wrote, Monty has done marvellous work with 3rd Division. He's transformed it. I know I can rely on the formation, and it's now my, my um, principal division. Monty is a leader of huge ability. This is how he gets away with actually being difficult. He has successes. And therefore, when he argues with Brooke, almost daily, when he was arguing with the Commander-in-Chief, Field Marshal Lord Gort, weekly, there was always this sense of, but he's doing so well with the division. Give him what he wants. But there was on one occasion, and it's interesting what that occasion was, when he was nearly sacked. And again, he was saved by the skin of his teeth by Alan Brooke. It's because he issued his men with condoms. Bizarre, and we've got to get our heads around the social niceties of the age. But basically, he would do anything for fighting efficiency. And he found that there was a 10% increase in venereal disease in his division. And so he wrote divisional order. If a man wants to have a woman, let him do so, whether with a whore or in the beetroot field with a farmer's daughter. But he must protect himself against infection. A soldier in hospital is no good to me. He's only good for the enemy. GOC, Thury Div, nearly lost his job over that. And in fact, he went right the way up to Whitehall and the Prime Minister. But he was saved. Um, trust, the next pillar. Um, after... The first divisional exercise, as I was saying, the purges began. He began to shuffle the pack. And he wrote to Brooke, Brooke I consider that in a frontline um, fighting division, it is necessary to have leaders of character and of personality that can inspire confidence in others. They must also know their job and conduct it professionally and successfully. Those that cannot must be removed immediately and I intend to do so. So it's the end of the first divisional exercise in November 1939. By the end of March 1940, at the end of the last divisional exercise, 80% of his NCOs and 70% of his officers had been changed. A lot of you will be saying, I bet he replaced them with people just like himself. himself. No, you're wrong. Some of them were. And they were called Monty men for a reason. They understood him. But he sought out diverse thought and people that actually held him to account. In fact, were a bit like him in as, in as much as they had different thoughts and would say, no, you're wrong there, sir, with respect. Throughout his career, he always tried to ensure that he had checks and balances within his top team. Freddie de Guingan, who becomes his famous chief of staff, was brilliant because he was very different from Montgomery. And of course, the one time when he was off in the Second World War, actually with a nervous breakdown, probably caused by Montgomery, was during Operation Market Garden, when Montgomery's hand wasn't held. Because actually, Montgomery's got this um, reputation for being quite conservative. He was nothing of the sort. 
he was quite radical. He was always wanting to take risks, and it was other people around him that said, come on, hold back, Monty. That's, quite an in that's another story, though. Um, and finally, professional knowledge. This takes us to the end of the talk and the end of the British in France. Having trained the division, having looked after his men, having created trust, 3rd Division were the best prepared division in the BEF come the German invasion on the 10th of May 1940. Time and time again, 3rd Division led the line, whether in the advance to stop the Germans, in withdrawal, in the evacuation, 3rd Division were always there, always outstanding. And a lot of this was based on that professional knowledge I spoke to you about, that he knew the ground, he had trained his troops for this, he'd got a top two team that he could trust and therefore he empowered them. He had studied generalship, he'd studied the enemy, he'd studied military art, he'd studied leadership. There was no army generalship programme then, there were no leadership interventions in the British Army like you guys enjoy today. He was self-taught, a self-taught leader, one of the very few that did that. And he'd studied the situation that he thought he'd find himself in, the context in which he thought he would find himself, and he led appropriately. On the night of the 27th, 28th of May, a large number of Allied divisions, British, French and Belgium, were in the Lille pocket here. And Field Marshal Lord Gort said, we've got to get out. We're going to be surrounded from the east, from the south, and from the west. The Germans could cut in here and pinch off the salient and just wipe us out. So Gort said, right, Brooke, I want you. You've got, you're my best corps. I want you to lead us out into the Dunkirk perimeter. Within an hour, Montgomery was on the move. On the night of the 27th, 28th, at night, in contact with the enemy, cutting, cutting across lines of communication within a couple of hundred yards of the enemy, Montgomery led the division along this red line and back to the Dunkirk perimeter, created a solid base, a cornerstone of the perimeter, and in that sort of follow me attitude, but at the divisional level, everybody else followed. Just at a time when they thought, right, we're gonna dig in here and die. That is just so important if you think about the history of the Second World War because all of those divisions got out of that little pocket. It meant that they got back to the Dunkirk perimeter, which meant that we could then evacuate them, which meant that we had an army back in England to do all of the things that we eventually do with that army, not least create a base for the Americans. And it was Alan Brook that was promoted during the Dunkirk perimeter operation to go and reorganise those divisions as they were coming back. And in the last days of the Dunkirk evacuation, Montgomery was promoted to acting lieutenant general and was given a call. And he was the last man of the corps off the Dunkirk beaches, I suppose as you would expect. But he nearly died three times during those last few hours. The Germans were that close. In fact, his ADC died in his arms. So, you know, that's Montgomery's story. So, you know, what, what conclusions do we draw from this? Well, the Dunkirk, oh, sorry, France 1940 was uh, undoubtedly a disaster for the Allies. Many senior officers come out very badly, but there are a couple that come out really well. Brooke is one, promoted. Monty's the other one. Um, I think that he had, with those four pillars that I've described, a good basis for a leadership style that suited the different contexts in which he found himself. Whether they would survive contact with followers today, I somehow doubt, but we've got to look at Montgomery's leadership in the context of the day. It's almost what the British Army needed at the time. He was a maverick. He was difficult, but my goodness, he drew the best out of the British Army. And I really do wonder if there hadn't been a Montgomery what might have happened after um, Dunkirk. But I'll just leave you with one final thought. Montgomery, after Dunkirk, gets a corps himself. 
then gets an army, then gets an army group. Were his competencies those that matched, those required of a strategic leader dealing with the Americans? How many times did Montgomery eventually almost torpedo our very important relationship with the Americans? I mean, Dwight Eisenhower said, Monty, you're a psycho. Everybody around the table sort of agreed. Yeah, he was. He said some pretty awful things and claimed successes that he hadn't had at the expense of the Americans. But I'll give the final word to um, Alan Brook. He said, Monty was far from a perfect general, but he did get results. He was respected for his military skills and he won... He, and he was the benchmark against which other British generals were measured. But by goodness, I spent more time as chief of the Imperial General Staff mopping up his mess than all of my other generals combined. Actually, I'll give you one final quote. And it was actually from Churchill, was a, who was a bit of an admirer. He said, Montgomery was indomitable in retreat, invincible in advance, and insufferable in victory. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much.